Hello, Blogging Heads Nation. This is the latest edition of Dresbert. I'm Daniel Dresner. I'm a professor of international politics at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and the author of the Spoiler Alerts blog for The Washington Post. And I'm Heather Hurlbert, run, runner of the New Models of Policy Change Project at New America. And we bring you today a fun-filled episode of um, people scre- uh, topics people scream at each other about. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're going to start with TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement, and the Fast Track Agreement that uh, Congress is attempting to vote on. And um, counter to the usual, where Dan takes the lead on subjects of international economy, I got a little tip from Dan that he's actually going to try to make this all about stuff he claims I understand better than he does. So we're going to see how that goes. Dan. Well, so... The reason I say this is because, I mean, if you want, we can talk about the substance of the TPP. But, I mean, I've, I've written about that, and I think we've had some back and forth on this, which is my my general take on this is for strategic reasons, I think it's a good, if not uncomplicated, idea. And for economic reasons, I also think it's a good, if not uncomplicated, idea. What I find fascinating about this has been the process through which, you know, Obama, the Obama administration has tried to get trade promotion authority because it's been made very clear by the other TPP negotiating partners, most explicitly, I think, New Zealand and Japan, that unless the, the United States has trade promotion authority, they're not going to negotiate uh, any more in terms of concessions with respect to TPP. And from their perspective, that is understandable because without trade promotion authority, Congress has the ability to amend anything it wants uh, onto the trade deal. And, you know, that's usually a recipe for lots of amendments that are essentially poison pills. So, as I understand it, the Republicans have, by and large, supported the idea of getting trade promotion authority passed, uh, with a few recalcitrant exceptions, at least on the Senate side. Um, a majority of the Senate Democrats are not keen at all about TPP, um, led by, among others, Harry Reid and Chuck Schumer, um, despite the Obama administration's you know, uh, efforts to, uh, to persuade them. Uh, those efforts extended over the last weekend to the point where uh, President Obama in some ways employed the exact same rhetorical tropes towards Elizabeth Warren and Democrats that he normally deploys towards Republicans, which is to say, um, I respect these guys, but they're just wrong. Um, I believe he called Elizabeth Warren uh, just a politician, which is just, you know, the worst thing you can call someone in Washington. Um, this all led to he a... He also a, a said hit. she didn't know what she was talking about, which is, um, I'm not I'm not sure when he's even said that about Republicans. So that, that was an interesting rhetorical... Uh, Escalation. That's true. Although, I mean, it should be pointed out, he's the, I mean, the, 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 he, that's the latest in what was a series of leaks by the White House making that same statement. I think um, Ben White had a story in Politico about this, um, about the various ways in which, you know, Elizabeth Warren claimed that TPP was somehow a, a backdoor method of, regu- uh, of eviscerating Dodd Frank, um, which is an interesting interpretation. And I actually tend to think Obama's correct about that. But that's, Anyway, I want to get to what happened this week, which I find interesting. So on the one hand, there was a procedural vote on Tuesday on whether or not trade promotion authority would go forward. And all of the Democrats except one um, sided with uh, voted no, which meant they didn't have enough. uh, They didn't have more than 60 votes to get through. And that was played all over the news pages on Tuesday as a defeat for the Obama administration, a demonstration he can't lead, yada, yada, yada. 24 hours later. Um, the administration had, uh, by that point, already called in the 10 Senate Democrats who were pro-TPP, but had nonetheless voted out of solidarity with uh, with Reid um, on this question. And lo and behold, an agreement was reached between Reid and McConnell, whereby trade promotion authority is going to go forward as a, with a vote. There will be a couple of other bills that will not be amendments to trade promotion authority that will also go forward. But in all likelihood, most of those don't really matter because Obama will veto them anyway. Um, I want to know what the hell happened. So you actually, at least one thing there, I would correct the way the way. Okay, please. Yes. So, so to go, to go back a little bit. um, So you have, there's, there's a couple different rash. There's the geopolitical rationale. Well, there's two different geopolitical rationales that have been advanced for this this trade agreement, and they differ depending on where you are in the U.S. So on the mm-hmm. West Coast, you hear the argument that this is an agreement, that the goal here is to bring China in, and 
Then in other places and among Republicans who like the agreement, you hear the geopolitical argument that the goal is to keep China out. So you have two, you have different groups of people who are either for or against it based on what they believe it does or doesn't do geopolitically vis-a-vis -vis China. So that is an interesting observation I would, I would make to start. The, the key thing that defines groups that are either for or against it for geopolitical reasons is they don't tend to care what's in it. That <laughs> the idea of either linking us together with all of our allies against China or creating a framework that, that we bring China into, people either like that or don't like it without really wanting to think too hard by and large about what that framework consists of. Then there's a whole other group of interest who are either for or against the idea of freer trade or differently managed or differently regulated trade between the U.S. and its Asian partners based explicitly on what does it do for my industry, my concern, right. my job, etc. So, so you have all of those going on at the same time, which is one of the reasons the debate around this seems so incoherent. I would also add, I would just add an additional one, which is there is an ideological component to this, which is, I mean, as you say, in some ways that's hived off from this, your second argument, which is TPP is not a traditional trade bill as we would, you know, as we would have thought of, let's say, you know, old GATT rounds and that there is tariff reduction, but there's a lot of other stuff going on there. Um, but very often the argument is pitched as simply a free trade agreement rather than, as you point out, an agreement that sets different kinds of standards than would otherwise have existed. Right. Well, and I'm glad you used the word ideological, actually, because there is ideological support for the agreement and ideological opposition to it that, that really, frankly, have nothing to do with what's in it. And yeah. so we do have we do have a pro free trade ideology, which is espoused by a lot of people who don't understand at all what's in the agreement. And we have an anti free trade ideology that's also espoused. So, so, so there's all of that as your backdrop. Then you add to that, um, the, um, Democratic Party in 2007, there was a, a big effort made in the Senate, um, as the Bush administration was trying to push through various trade agreements. This is something administrations get around to doing when they don't have to face Year the six, seven, eight, yes. Yeah. Um, where the basically different wings of the party got together and said, okay, what can we hammer out some standards for how we want to do trade? And, you know, the interesting thing is this happened towards the end of the Clinton administration. I happened to be, I was in the White House at the time. And the administration, the last couple of post-NAFTA, post-China trade agreements it negotiated had significant sort of unprecedented labor and environmental safeguards, Bush administration, right. you know, promptly threw those out. So this 2007 agreement was really the Democrats trying to, to rebuild some minimal level of party consensus and say, if you bring trade agreements that have these procedures in them, um, we, you will not get an all-out fight. You will be able to assemble a, a, a coalition to pass them. So there is considerable bad feeling among Democrats in the Senate that they worked hard to create this thing, and the Obama administration appears to have paid no attention to it in the negotiating, right? So that's point one. Point okay. two is the style with which the administration has done, has done most of what it's done, hasn't, has never felt very, um, inclusive, loving, and service oriented, if you will, to, to members of the Senate, who you have to remember, each one of them gets up in the morning, looks in the mirror, and says, what's the difference between me and Barack Obama? Right? So, so there's a lot of anger, just sort of, oh, they didn't include us, they didn't show us. So, so quite, you have, you have interest groups saying, oh, the text is secret. And then you have senators yeah. from a totally different vantage point saying, whoa, the text is secret. So, so that, just that dynamic between this White House and the Senate always made this a bigger, a bigger lift than it was going to be otherwise. The third point where I think, um, people have misunderstood this is, Yes, there's a lot of Republicans in the Senate have lined up pretty reliably behind this agreement. But Republicans in the House have been making it very clear to anyone who will listen that, you know, even if Obama sent up a bill naming Ronald Reagan the greatest president ever, they wouldn't vote for it because it comes from Obama. So you have an indigestible or an apparently indigestible lump of Republicans in the House who are just making it as clear as they can that they won't vote for, for trade promotion authority. And that, you know, has had some blowback on. So then on top, like all of that wasn't crazy and difficult enough already. Then some bright sparks in the Republican Party thought, oh, what better opportunity to show 
Bibi Netanyahu's new government, how much we love it, and put language, attached language to the fast track bill, basically endorsing Israeli construction of settlements in the West Bank. So now, huh. you're, if you're voting for trade promotion authority, you're also voting for settlements. You know, how, how, uh, how wonderful an example of the democratic legislative process is that? So that's the backdrop to all of this. Then some Democrats go to McConnell and say, so, you know, here's some things that we think are missing from what we understand of the TPP that we want to see addressed. So we want you to move a bill that targets Chinese currency manipulation. We want you to move some trade agreements with Africa, which we believe will actually do more to alleviate poverty mm -hmm. and, you know, provide the kinds of geostrategic benefits of, of lifting all boats that trade is supposed to provide than TPP will. And McConnell says, you know, no, why should I? You're going to vote on this the way I want it. I'm the majority leader. You, you, I don't got it, basically. Heather, can I ask you a question at this point? Because this is one thing that's been unclear to me, because my understanding is, is that when the initial outline of the TPA, the Trade Promotion Authority deal was negotiated between Wyden and uh, the Republicans, was the understanding then that Wyden would be able to bring these other potential amendments or not? In other words, I want to know if the status quo shifted because the Democrats suddenly wanted to bring these bills far, and McConnell said that wasn't in our understanding, or was it that, McCon you know, the understanding was these bills could come forward and McConnell suddenly changed the terms. So my understanding is the second that the, that, that the Dems believed the bills could come forward and, and McConnell changed his terms. Uh, it's not clear to me at what point in the process they emerged. And okay. the, the other thing that, that you should add here is this is one in a series of, um, if you look back to the, the bill around congressional participation in the Iran negotiations, which I think you and I were talking about last yeah. time we met. So there was a deal with McConnell about how the bill would go to the floor, and it didn't go to the floor that way. So mm -hmm. it wouldn't at all surprise me if there weren't some uh, residual bad, I mean, look, there's huge amounts of residual bad feeling already. So, you know, on the one hand, yeah, there was a very strong Senate Democratic rejection of, of McConnell moving this the way McConnell wanted to move it. But Number one, that was about McConnell insisting on moving it a particular way. And number mm -hmm. two, it gave everybody a chance to vote no and get and, and let the let right. their constituents be happy. And then, you know, it made everyone push a little harder and now it will move. But that's still I, I they have not solved their problem in the House. So No, I I this remember may when all the initial... be somewhat irrelevant, which I think has been has been a little bit missed up to no, no, no. I think, I mean, when the original deal, I mean, it was Ryan who negotiated, you know, like about a month or two ago, you know, basically the outlines for what trade promotion authority would look like. And I remember the original story basically suggested that there weren't going to be, that the numbers in the House were dicey. So I, I will, uh, I will take your, your grant on that. So your argument is, is that the way this was reported, at least out on Tuesday, which was Senate Democrats hand Obama a defeat. Your argument is, is that that was not the right way to think about this, that this actually had to do with just Senate procedure. I mean, it had to do with handing McConnell a defeat, first and mm -hmm. foremost, but there is no question that a lot of Senate Democrats, well, all the Senate Democrats except Tom Carper, were right. angry, um, frustrated with, with the way the negotiation went out, and frustrated with the amount of, of grief they're getting from their constituents about this. So I don't think... Um, you don't hear, you haven't heard any senators going to the press and saying, well, gosh, it just was so awful that McConnell put us in this situation that we had to vote against the president's priority. You know, so I don't think anyone was sad about using the opportunity to poke the White House. But, mm -hmm. but you know, if McConnell had chosen to handle it differently, yeah, they would have passed it on the first go round. Okay. I mean, I would, I would say the thing, of, the things that I'm fascinated by here are, is much more about the politics and the policy on this. Um, in in two ways. The first is is that we're increasingly seeing the, the Democrats voting no on Tuesday kind of reminds me of the number of times John Boehner has basically had to bring bills that he knew were not going to get through the House, um, nonetheless, to a vote so people could vote on them, um, which is something that I'm not sure would have necessarily happened even, let's say, 10 or 20 years ago, where you know, you didn't need those kinds of expressive votes necessarily because everyone knew what the vote count was and there was no point in wasting everyone's time going through that. And yet nowadays, clearly that 
that matters. The other thing that I'm interested in is this notion of, I mean, you know, you and I have, have had to read a lot of these, you know, why can't Obama lead kind of stories for the last six, seven years. Um, and it is easy to chuckle and laugh at a lot of them because in some ways what they're asking for Obama to do, you know, just can't be done in this sort of modern day polarizing era. Um, what I find fascinating about TPP, though, or, or Trade Promotion Authority, is, is two things. First, Mitch McConnell might have given the most honest interview I've ever seen him give to the New York Times, where he actually just said flat out, the notion that Obama, if only he had like drunk whiskey with us a little more, would have gotten us the GOP to vote with him on stuff is absurd. That's not the way this works. And I think he said literally, look, this is a business, meaning that, you know, we'll cooperate with Obama when our interests line up and we're not going to cooperate when we don't, um, which sort of puts the lie to God knows how many years of hand wringing over whether or not um, Obama should have been hand holding the, the Republicans uh, for the last six or seven years. On the other hand, as you said in your sort of recount, one of the things that, you know, while I think why can't Obama lead is generally a bullshit question, with regards to his own caucus, I do wonder if there's a little bit in which that's applicable. Um, because the degree of resentment that, you know, some Democrats had about the way that Obama, as you can say, was talking, you know, about how Elizabeth Warren is flat wrong. And then there was this stupid contretemps over the fact that Obama called Elizabeth Warren by her first name. Um, you know, which all might be a distraction, but it does lead me to wonder just whether, you know, the, the president has the ability to actually manage his own party, much less every, anything else. Well, I mean, to be fair, any president's ability to manage his own party declines as his second yeah. term wears on. So, right. so there's a certain element of um, things that have festered for a while and maybe are not that relevant anymore, but coming up now. Yeah. Um, and I will also say that I'm... I'm really glad you, you mentioned that about McConnell because I am a structuralist and not right. a great man of history person. And yeah. indeed, if the interests don't point for, Rush, for Republicans or Democrats, for that matter, to collaborate with any White House, they won't. And that is, I don't know, 90 percent of. But there is the 10 percent. But there is the 10 percent. Right, exactly. That a leader has to frame how how other leaders perceive their interests, and how other leaders perceive that he or she can affect their interests. And there, I think, there has been throughout a certain amount of disdain for the Senate and the House. And, mm -hmm. you know, look, I mean, if you look at polls, that's a disdain that's heartily shared by Americans. But <laughs> it's possible it's possible that, it, you know, there was a um, fascinating piece, I think it's in the Huffington Post today, quoting a, a pro-trade House Republican who said, you know, look, I don't think this president could pick me out of a crowd, and then saying, it's not like when Bill Clinton was president, <laughs> which, you know, it's not something you see a Republican saying every day. So, so yeah, there is, there is a personal element. And actually, funnily enough, we really have completely switched roles here, because I want to go back to the policy a little bit. There we go. <laughs> um, in that, you know, there's there's just some of, I think, the way this was handled stylistically relates to some policy choices that were made early on. And, you know, you could have looked at this big agreement as sort of your key goal here was to forge a new American consensus or a new Democratic consensus if you were feeling more, more um, partisan on that particular day on, on how to do trade. And you could have said the most important thing in how we negotiate this agreement is in sort of bringing my whole party or sort of having a coalition, having a broad coalition and bringing it along with me every step of the way. Um, or you could say the most important thing in negotiating this agreement is that we have an agreement. Mm -hmm. And who's the engine of how we get at the agreement? The engine of how we get that agreement is big corporations that have sway both in the U.S. and in the other societies. So right. who is it most important to have thoroughly bought into the deal? And then you could also see why a Democratic president would think, well, if we have big corporations bought into the deal, that will ensure in the end that we bring enough Republicans along to get it through and that business will do some of the heavy lifting and I, the Democrat, will not have to do all the heavy lifting. So I think mm -hmm. a choice was made. Whether it was made consciously or whether it was just made out of force of habit, I'm not really sure. But to say, 
no, you know, it's going to be too much trouble. It's not the most important thing. Maybe they don't really care that much anyway. So we don't need to go through all the extra hassle and bother and internal negotiating that it would have taken to do trade agreements in the way that the, the 2007 Senate agreement, De Senate Democrats agreement imagined. We're just going to sort of hand it over to the guys and their friends from the Chamber of Commerce, and we're going to send them off to do it. And well, that, not, that made I'm, it kind of inevitable that you would have a lot of secrecy and a lot of angry interest groups outside the process. True, although I'm not sure your first option ever was going to be viable. I mean, bear in mind, we are in year seven now of the TPP using what Obama, you know, took the second option that you offered, um, which in theory should have, you know, been a more expedited process. And this is sort of barely getting there. And one of the interesting questions is, is that, you know, whether or not, assuming this passes the Senate and passes the House, and assuming TPP finally gets negotiated, the elements of trade promotion authority are such that you have to wait four months before Obama can bring the bill to Congress anyway, which means we're going to be in 2016 probably when this happens. Um, which, you know, and again, this is the expedited route. It is far from clear to me that the first way that you were talking about would have actually led to any version of trade promotion authority being passed. Maybe if the Democrats had held on to their, you know, the Senate majority uh, in the midterms. But I think once that happened, you know, if if you're the president, this is the logical course of action. And in some ways, this goes to the second point on, in terms of policy, which is what is the purpose of the TPP, I think, from Obama's perspective. I have to say, I'm actually struck by this is the president who, for the first six years of his, you know, in office, was barely, if at all, enthusiastic about his own trade agenda. Um, and it is striking to me how in the last two months he has suddenly become much more full-throated about this in a way that I had not seen him uh, before. Um, I can guess what this is about. I mean, it's part, you know, people will say it's about legacy building. I don't think it's it, that's really fair. Um, but I assume one of the things he wants is, from a strategic perspective, he wants the deal because the deal sends important signals to key allies. And fortunately enough, I don't think is seen necessarily as terribly threatening or containing by China, in fact. Well, this is where I think, you know, that thing that we love to tell kids about the uh, the thing that looks like the shortcut not necessarily being the shortcut. Mm -hmm. um, so if, this de if, if trade promotion authority doesn't get through the House, mm -hmm. right, and if trade promotion authority doesn't get through the House, you know, there'll be two stories. One story is there'll be a bunch of Republicans that, you know, as I said, wouldn't vote for, wouldn't vote for a bill to name Ronald Reagan the greatest president ever if it came from this White House. Obama, right, right. But there will also be a group of Democrats who yes. looked at their president and just said, no. Yep. We're, we're ha and then you got to ask yourself, should you have invested more energy at the beginning to make sure that your own party was going to trust you and stay with you on this, even though they're not the majority anymore, you still would have had enough votes to move to move trade promotion authority through. And so, in in that sense, you know, would you, and if you're you imagine yourself being the next president, I mean, and I think, you know, pretty much anybody, I I know that Secretary Clinton is trying to avoid getting sucked into this for reasons <laughs> for reasons that are politically understandable if which painful, we'll get to in a second yes if painful to watch but yeah. you know so you imagine being president from either party in 2017 and, and which would you rather inherit would you rather inherit a negotiation that had dragged out a long time or would you rather inherit a negotiation that had come to completion and your predecessor hadn't been able to get through congress so you know the the thing that seems more expeditious is not always more expeditious hmm. Although that gives me hope, actually, that the deal will actually get through, period, in the end. But that's a whole, uh, that's a separate conversation. But your, your mentioning of Hillary Clinton and the 2016 race that is heating up strikes me as a lovely segue uh, to talk about the big speech that Senator Marco Rubio gave uh, yesterday at the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, I don't know if you had an opportunity to hear it or read it. I had the joy of reading it over coffee this morning, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Your tone of voice when you said the word joy was priceless. Okay, uh, so I will just serve this up for you. You can tell me what your take is. I, I, I'll be happy to, to play tennis on this one. I, it's like two different speeches. It's very interesting. I mean, I was being snarky, but it really was very interesting to look at the transcript because 
So there was a speech and there was Q and A. Right. And, and the Q and A is the Q and A is I have to say on is a general rule I find is always more interesting in these things. But go well, ahead. In the Q and A, you see someone who has a fairly broad, maybe also deep understanding of issues, some fairly sophisticated ideas about things, some grasp of world events and how they connect to each other, um, you know, and some significant skill and subtlety at parrying questions. Right. Right. So, so the Q and A is a pretty impressive display. The speech itself is is really a, a piece of sheer ideological bombast. And I say this as someone who has written CFR speeches for presidential candidates. So, you know, I you know I, of what you speak. I know of what I shovel is what I would. What I would <laughs> and. It's for, for Rubio who, you know, if you think about, what is it, sort of four, three, four years ago, he was giving his, his maiden, I am a senator foreign policy expert speech at Brookings. It was, no, it was 2012. Actually at CFR. Actually. He gave a speech at CFR. He gave a speech at CFR. He gave a speech at Brookings. Yeah. And, um, of, of all of those, this was the least sophisticated. Um, and the least nuanced and the least, um, Reality based. I mean, Neocani, you know. E well, no, it's interesting. I mean, even Jennifer Rubin, who mm -hmm. loved it, right. um, had a, a gentle, or for her, a very gentle line in her commentary in the post saying, you know, Rubio needs to connect his principles to specific events. Oh, yeah, there were absolutely, there was, there was not a shred of detail in anything in the actual speech, except opposition to what, to, um, Opposition to the Iran deal and support for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Oh, and that, that, that was the other, actually. So he, the speech had three pillars. Yeah. Um, the U.S. has to be military strong, militarily right. strong. I, can I just stay here? I, I, I don't know if you read the t actual text of the speech. The, the, t the version that I had, um, which was on Medium, I think, what I loved was that American strength was capitalized throughout the entire speech. It was like this, like, you know, brand name that I was looking forward to, that, like a new American Express product or something. Yeah, no, I noticed there were some interesting punk, um, capitalization choices, yes. but I, I find myself just generally to be an old fogey about that, and that in general our, our capitalizing habits are becoming more German, except the Germans actually have rules for what you capitalize, and we just capitalize stuff that seems interesting or important. <laughs> um, but sorry, go ahead. You were talking about the three So, pillars. So, you know, the pillar number one is when we're most militarily strong is when peace happens, which, mm -hmm. you know, PhD dissertations have been written about. Pillar number three is we need increased moral clarity, which, you know, good luck with that. And pillar number two is it's the economy, except his only actual thing he thought we should do about the economy was pass TPP. Yeah, which, well, no, which no, no, I found was... really dis, I mean, you know, you can have a serious debate about how the heck what the heck is the path ahead for U.S. and the global economy? And it would be really interesting, and there are different views. Uh, but you didn't find any of that in the speech. I mean, all right, so here was my take on that pillar, because as you can imagine, I was I was intrigued by this. Um, I would say, well, first I would step back and say the thing about this speech that is simultaneously maybe marginally hopeful and also really depressed is that, as you say, in the Q&A, Rubio clearly displays a dexterity and familiarity, familiarity with the issues that he's talking about, which, again, compared to the almost entire crop of other GOP presidential candidates, is somewhat refreshing. Um, which, again, I, I, you know, you've got to consider the baseline here. But what is striking to me is that in a GOP primary where apparently national security is going to matter one whole hell of a lot, Almost none of these guys have anything remotely approaching national security experience. In that sense, Rubio, again, only in comparison, stands out. Um, and that he's actually been on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for four years and been on, uh, I think, Homeland Security as well, and actually is, is genuinely interested in this. Um, that's not to say I agreed with a lot of his, his speech, but at least I, you know, you could recognize, particularly in the Q&A, that this is someone who actually knew somewhat what he was talking about. Um, on the actual pillar that you were talking about, I think that was in, in some ways there, there rhetorically, the thing I liked about it was that he was clearly attempting to link things like, let's say Iran somehow threatening tankers in the Straits of Hormuz with Russian and Chinese, um, cyber attacks. 
So it was a way in which, weirdly, it was a very sort of neoconservative effort to identify enemies to the open liberal international order. That said, as you point out, the problem with that part of the speech is that all he says is, is, is that he's going to use American power to protect the global economy without any explanation about what exactly he means by American power or what sort of tools would be used or how or what are the risks or any of that. Now, this is the first speech in his campaign. So, you know, I, I, I do tend to think that, you know, calling out for specifics now doesn't necessarily make a whole hell of a lot of sense. But, um, you know, if, uh, but that said, you're right. At some point, it's got to happen. My concern is that, frankly, the state of foreign policy uh, rhetoric among the GOP presidential candidates at this point is so low that Rubio will actually look deft by comparison. You know, so there's there's two things. One is that was a deft, a decently deft performance, and right. he should get credit for that. And I have yeah. I've no problem with that. Um, I do think that it's a mistake to frame. Um, it's a mistake to frame what the GOP primary candidates are going to be trying to hone in on as as a foreign policy debate in any way, because what it really is is an American anxiety debate. And, you know, I wrote about this, and you and I talked about the thing that right, Scott Walker right. said. Yeah. And, you know, you've seen, um, you've seen the poll numbers now that, that um, GOP voters are more anxious about national security than about the economy. Yeah. But um, you also saw yesterday Jeb Bush get called out twice by <laughs> um, sort of normal Americans at public fora about the I would have invaded Iraq again business. Mm -hmm. So... So these guys, the, the needle they have to thread is really to convince their voters that this is the guy that voting for this guy will make me feel better. Well, this, so this is something that I've been writing about for about a year now. But the argument I would make here is that you're right, that, that what, what Americans are uncomfortable with is they don't like the outcomes right now of current American foreign policy. They don't like the fact that Russia is in Ukraine. They don't like the fact that Iraq seems to be falling apart. They don't like the fact that Syria is in a bloody civil war. Um, or that China seems to be, you know, throwing its weight around in the South China Sea. Uh, so if you talk about outcomes, I would say that that Americans, you know, and you poll them, Americans are sympathetic with what Republicans say they want to do, uh, because Republicans at this point are campaigning all in the form of this is the world I see us living in, which is one where Russia is out of Ukraine and so on and so forth. But the moment you shift the questions from foreign policy outcomes to foreign policy outputs, as in what should the U.S. government do? Then suddenly, I think even in some cases, Republicans start, you know, expressing preferences that are much more consistent with what the Obama administration is actually doing. Um, and so that's the trick on this one, which is to say that uh, and I think that's why I am concerned about the lack of detail going forward, because there is no incentive for any of these guys to provide detail, because it's much more sensible for them to say is essentially the world is on fire and I will put the fire out without saying exactly what I'm doing to put the fire out. Well, and I think the reason for that, at the risk of, of repeating myself, is that even more than outcomes and outputs, what people vote on is 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 how do I feel? How does this guy make me feel? Mm -hmm. And you know, the the genius of Scott Walker, which you know I know is not a phrase that everyone is comfortable with, but the genius of Scott Walker is that he clearly understands grasps that you know American politics is about how the voter feels about you. You know that, and increasingly, as as everything gets more and more um, sort of consumerized, right? How do we feel about consuming candidate A or candidate B or candidate C? Although I would add the other the other wild card here, though, is that you know money matters to some to some extent, and so it's not just how the American voter feels; it's also how the donor um, thinking about setting up a super PAC feels. And this is actually an area where. It's not obvious to me that Scott Walker is necessarily going to do terribly well. In fact, that's where he ran into trouble back in January and February. And this is an area where that might be the, the edge that Marco Rubio will have going forward, although whether that actually matters in terms of votes is another question entirely. Well, this strays a little bit outside of our, our topic area, but you know, something you are seeing in this primary that you haven't seen for a long time and maybe not ever quite in this way in American politics is that you have, you know, you have the Sheldon Adelson primary, you have the Koch brothers primary. Um, so you can, we may get to a point, or we will definitely get to a point where you have several candidates 
who are so well funded that money is is so relevant that it's almost irrelevant. Right, or that that money it, it essentially you you hit the law of diminishing marginal returns, which is it doesn't matter if Jeb Bush outraises Scott Walker, if Walker has sufficient amounts of money, the the difference won't be that much of a uh, that much, which is which will be interesting going forward. Um, I need to get going relatively quickly. Uh, so one last point, which I'm I'm just finding adorable, is uh, the report that came out I think by ESPN uh, about FIFA, uh, namely FIFA President Sepp Blatter. Um, the rumor being that Sepp Blatter will no longer uh, set foot in the United States because he fears being questioned by the FBI about allegations of corruption surrounding the bids, uh, the winning bids that uh, Russia got it for to host the, is it 2018 or 2020? 2020 World Cup and um, 2018 maybe. Yeah, 2018. Sorry, 2018. And uh uh, gutters uh, winning bid for the 2022 World Cup. So, Americans, we can be proud. Spain <laughs> may be the country that you can't go if you to if you have committed human rights violations. But darn it, if you are defrauding football fans, the USA will never be a bastion of safety for you. Um, the other point I actually wanted to make about FIFA, kind of as a, is that you know yesterday um, people will have seen that. The Pope announced that the Vatican is moving to to treat Palestine as a as a state. What people may not have seen yesterday was the headline in Haaretz that Israeli diplomats were scrambling because there's a move afoot in FIFA to expel Israel. So Whoa. I was thinking, has any government? I mean, the, the the week where you lose the Vatican and FIFA, that's a bad week for a for a new and weak coalition government. So I just. I just leave you with with the moment of you know could FIFA topple a government? Well, I will say this. I mean, what you know, someone who studies sanctions, one of the long you know one of the the well known um, anecdotes about the reason the South Africa sanctions essentially worked, the argument has always been that that the sort of the moment where South Africa you know the the South Africans knew that things were going to have to change was when they were suddenly um, uh, suffering from sports sanctions if their teams couldn't compete anymore. Um, international competitions like rugby or football. Um, I don't think that's actually been exaggerated to some extent. I think it mattered, but I don't think it mattered near, uh, quite as much as is commonly thought. Um, so, yeah, that could be a problem going forward. All right. Well, you heard it first here on Dresbert. Um, Dan, it was great, as always. And um, Wonderful, as always. I look forward to next month. Hey, my, my, my hometown baseball team has climbed out of the cellar. May yours do the same. Uh don't, don't even talk to me about this. The only, the only comfort I draw from the Red Sox woes is that I've got a lot of writing I have to do this summer, and now I don't have to obsess about the sports pages. <laughs> Until next time. Yep. Yep.